Here in Copenhagen, it's midway through the second week of talks. It's freezing outside, actually it's snowing, but inside the Bella Centre, temperatures are soaring. Talks are completely deadlocked over deep divides between rich and poor nations. Today, I met with one climatologist who's seen it all before. Over the past three decades, Stephen Schneider has worked at the interface of climate science and policy. Writing in his new book, Science as a Contact Sport, Schneider says that at times the journey has been turbulent. I started by asking Schneider whether he thought the stark warnings from climatologists were finally getting through to policymakers here in Copenhagen. Science doesn't tell you how to do anything. Science is risk. Risk is what can happen multiplied times the probability it will happen. Risk management is what kind of risks do you want to take with a planetary life support system. I happen to be a risk averse person and I think that we should be investing tremendously to reduce it, but that's a personal value judgment. Other people say that's going to hurt the market share of the coal industry which employs a million people and that's too serious a side effect, we'll just tolerate climate. So you're really running a whole series of value judgments about how much insurance you want to buy for the planetary life support system. What's worse now is the ugliness of the attacks. Back then they would say, oh, you're wrong-headed, you're ignoring the sun. Now they send, Professor Flip-Flop, cooling then, now warming. You're just a liar, and then they use words that I can't put on your blog site. They tell me I'm un-American because I work with the UN, which wants to kill American independence. And what I thought in science as a contact sport was history is worse now than it was before. Sometimes I get so annoyed I call it the denier's battle of the bulge. Just like in 44, when the Germans knew they were going to lose the war, well, let's take down as many as we can with us. And that's sort of what's going on now. It's just really outrageous. Let me start with the EU target of two degrees, which is quite sensible, but it is not a target of dangerous. Because at 1.8, there'll be plenty of dangerous things. At 2.2, the world doesn't turn into a climatic pumpkin where everything comes to an end. It's not a runaway greenhouse effect. What it is, is it's a judgment about where to put a line in the sand on enough is enough. It's based on science, including my chapter in IPCC, where we show not that there's a hard threshold at two degrees above, but that there's an accumulation of the number of systems hurt and the depth to which the harm occurs around two. It's not a hard two. It's spread out over, you know, maybe one to three, and after three, you really start getting nasty outcomes. Why else do the EU say two? Because they're political realists. They know the inertia in the system. They know it takes decades to replace lots of coal with alternatives. They know it's going to take even longer than that to get the developing world to agree to leapfrog over the Industrial Revolution. So they named the lowest number that we have a plausible shot at. I don't see any way that we stay under one and a half. And I'm with Tuvalu, but it's just unlikely to happen. Scientifically, I think there's a very high probability that we will overshoot that two degree target by a fair amount. And then come screaming off the back end, probably after we have catastrophic events. 20, 30 years from now, then people say, oh my God, what have we done? By that time, we've invented cheap enough technology to get it done. I hope that that scenario doesn't happen, but at the moment, I would not, you know, bet a lot against it. But the science itself can't tell you what to do. I'm disappointed in the U.S. position, but that's because I'm angry about the congressional position and relatively happy about the administration position, which collectively leads to a very weak short-term set of goals. But I think there's too much focus among the developing countries and the small island states on what we do in terms of the percentages of cuts to 2020. In fact, when I get mad, I say, come on, guys, get off the numerology. How much we cut to 2020 is not really that important. What's important is that by 2030, 40, and 50, we're down to well below 80% of these emissions. The numerology I want us to be bindingly committed to is how many tens of billions are you going to spend every year, what are you going to spend it on, and how are you going to help the developing world leapfrog over the, the Industrial Revolution, and how are you going to help the poorest of the poor with adaptation to problems they didn't create. That's the numbers I care about. 
I suspect that Copenhagen will have either a weak or no target. It will have some aspirational goal, which is good, and that aspirational goal will probably be expressed beyond 2020, like 2030, because it does take more than a decade to get rid of existing infrastructure. But what if it does right, what it'll do is it will set up finance mechanisms for both adaptation and for technology transfer. If Copenhagen starts to set those up, even though they won't be final, I will not consider it a, a failure. Remember, we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the mediocre. You know, the cliche is the good. We're not going to get near good. But mediocre is better than going at high speed in the wrong direction, like we did in the Bush administration. That was Stanford climatologist Stephen Schneider. Just two days remain now before more than 100 world leaders will descend on Copenhagen, hoping to sign a historic deal on climate change. Inside the Bella Centre, opinion remains divided over whether their arrival will give the negotiations a much-needed push. Whether these talks will actually result in a climate change deal, even a mediocre one, remains anyone's guess. This is Olive Heffernan for Nature in Copenhagen. We'll be posting videos and blogs for the rest of the week, so check in with us later.